Welcome to a guide to, wait for it, summer fishing in conjunction with JRC and Carpology. Uh, wearing the same clothes that I had on in March and it's the middle of May, it's gone past the middle of May now and um, it's probably going to be the coldest May in history straight after the coldest April in history. But that won't bother us because everything we're going to talk about is going to be pertinent to and relating to summer carp fishing. It's a whole different um, ethos, it's a, a different game, it's a different match to the other seasons, clearly. There's a lot of different things at play and we're going to look at those in turn, talk about the, the different relative aspects, changes that we should make, things we should cons uh, consider. Um, and we're down here at the beautiful Hintlesham Fisheries in Suffolk and we've got a lovely li lily pad lined, it's not easy to say, that lily pad lined bay um, which is behind me, sort of a long length terminating in a bay to my right. Um, the fish have been getting down here a bit, I've had a few bites today already so that's been nice and um, it's, well it's the same with all carp fishing isn't it, location comes first and foremost so why am I sat here? So let's, let's start off by looking before we get into the myriad of, of summer details, let's look at location in the summertime. So certainly one of the reasons I'm here right now is because this arm is really, really heavily padded. So that means that during the summertime, I'm looking for any kind of feature or cover. So snags, lily pads, and of course, the one salient, most attractive thing to carp above all else thick thick weed. There isn't any weed in this lake but that means that the pads and the snags down to my right are going to be even more attractive in, in terms of cover. So let's take weed uh, as the first port of call. Now the interesting thing I find about weed is that carp will flock to areas of thick weed and anglers will run as fast away from them as they can. I've seen this even this week on a, a very busy day ticket lake near to where I'm fishing on my syndicate and one end of the lake is is festooned in thick thick weed beds and all the carp were in the weed beds and all the anglers were up the other end because they didn't like dealing with weed. You see that everywhere you go and in terms of location with carp being wild animals you, you, you could look further into location as part of the watercraft video by the way which is on, on this channel which really goes into location but in terms of weed I would say that weed is the only definite factor controlling location of carp because everything else is variables. Do they follow the wind? Yeah they might, they might not. Are they going to be in deep water? Uh, maybe on some lakes maybe they're in shallow water on other lakes. Are they in silty gullies or on top of gravel bars? So the rules are it's a constantly moving subject which needs uh, constant assessment. But if you had to press me for one rule that was always pertinent, that was always um, a banker in terms of location, it's weed. And this applies summer, winter, spring, wherever on your lake it the weed is at its thickest is where the majority of the carp will spend the majority of their time and you can certainly find that in the summer months so from uh, from now until September later than that actually wherever the weed is thickest the carp will congregate and stay sometimes for the entirety of the summer so although they will sometimes break away and travel other parts of the lake the focal point for their day and night time activities quite often is around these massive weed beds. Quite often at night time you will find that they leave the weediest areas temporarily. Let's assume that the rest of the lake is only moderately weedy and one part is very weedy. Now at night the weed will suck the oxygen out of the water so in the small hours of the morning sometimes the fish will move out of the areas of thick weed but not for very long you know I'm talking for two or three hours possibly of a day and they'll only do that if there are other areas of the lake that aren't particularly weedy if the whole lake is pretty weedy but they're in a massive weed bed it's not going to make any difference to them and they'll just tolerate the drop in oxygen but the point is that 
wherever the weed is thickest is where the carp will spend the majority of their time and very often I've seen it the entirety of the summer. The whole, the whole four or five months or whatever, maybe a few weeks if we're lucky, um, and they can stay there. So the key thing of course is don't be afraid of weed. Get your head around the fact that carp love it just pretty much more than anything else. And if you learn to love it and not be afraid of it, then those two things will dovetail together and give you plenty of wet landing nets. So let's just um, continue down the theme of weed fishing now or, or fishing in the summer months because this is the time of year that your tackle needs to be really up to the job. Forget all the small hooks and uh, the, the light mono hook links and so on that you might have used in the winter to get a bite when it was really hard. The summer is a different game. The carp can be very, very gung-ho. They can be supercharged, especially just post-spawning. If they're stripped out of milk and eggs and they lost a few pounds, then they're ready to, they're ready to go, you know? So you can expect harder fights from the carp. You can expect weed. You can expect lily pads. You can expect maybe some snag fishing. So your tackle has to be up to the, uh, up to the game up to what's required of it. So for me that means strong hooks, not necessarily big hooks, but you wouldn't normally find me going below a six. Six is pretty much what I'd use. Um, and it's the time to be using your strong coated braid hook links, um, your thick main line. I mean, thick main line is absolutely imperative. Uh, there's, there isn't really a more important piece of your fishing tackle in the summer months than very thick, strong line. What do I mean by thick? We've done a section on lines and so on before in, uh, in one of these videos, but the rule of thumb for me for summer fishing, because it is so demanding on your end tackle, on your line, is to use a line which has got a 0.4 millimetres diameter. Some companies would rate that as about a 15 pound line, but some companies will uh, underrate their line severely. So don't buy by breaking strain, buy by diameter. Look what it says on the tin and a good, good line for summer use is a 0.4 millimetres line. I've, uh, I've got a test uh, fluorocarbon on my reels at the moment, but um, the Berkeley lines, the CM70 and CM90, although they're very hard to get hold of now, they're very good and reliable. But again, it all comes down to diameter. Most of the time in the summer, you don't need to fish at really long range. It tends to be more of a, a winter thing. In fact, I fish all over the country, different lakes and so on. And even fishing more than 80 yards is very rare for me. And certainly with a 0.4 line and a three and a half ounce lead, I could get out 100 yards if I needed to. So don't think, oh, it's really thick. It's going to stop me getting out to the distance I need, unless you're on one of those few lakes where distance really is everything. If you do start compromising your diameter, then straight away you're compromising your potential hook to landed ratio because there's been so many times in the past where using really thick strong line 0.4 and I've landed a fish and I found it shaved or chafed up by mussels or a gravel bar or any, any abrasive medium under the, under the surface of the water. And I look at that and I think, hmm, if that had been a 0.35 millimetre line, then that fish wouldn't be in my net. But because I've got such a thick line on, it sustained the damage and there's still enough um, strength retained within that line, even though some of it is removed, there's still enough there left to land me the fish. If you took that percentage of surface area off a thinner line, obviously you've got a lot less and things start to go wrong. So it's a good safety barrier. Thick lines sink better than thin lines as well. You know, you can get them down through the surface of the water. So it was some advice given to me a long time ago by a very, very good angler fish as strong and thick a line as you can get away with and it's something that I still adhere to to this day, vitally important. So if you only take one thing from this video, take that, thick strong lines, fish safe and try and land everything you hook. A lot of people seem to think getting bites is the name of the game, it's not. Fish on the bank is really the only thing that counts, so if you're getting bites and not landing them you need to have a very very close look at what you're doing. You tend to see that a lot with snag fishing. It's quite common on a lot of lakes in the summer months to find fish held up in snags. I, I really hate snag fishing. I just find it too stressful uh, for me and for the, for the fish. 
you know to, to safely snag fish you can't be in a sleeping bag and safely snag fish so if I do do it it's just for a day sessions or um, or if I'm doing overnights I'll bring my rods away from the snags and put them somewhere else there is no way you can get out of a sleeping bag out of a bivvy to the rods and stop it from getting into snags because if you're fishing close to snags even a mid double with a stretch in the line you know most monos have got a 20 percent um, stretch factor so once you realize that and factor that into the distance a fish can go when that line is fully um, stretched out it's considerable you know so I, I really would implore you if you can't fish snag safely please don't when it comes to snag fishing again i don't like to use any kind of um, really thick heavy leaders or anything like that um, just some good thick rig tube bit of putty up the line and a drop off lead off the clip is is more than adequate but um, again do not snag fish if you can't land them safely there's a lot of things you can do to improve your hook to landed ratio apart from fishing locked up you know actually on that note if you are going to fish locked up to snags then make sure your rod cannot move uh, a bivy peg in front of the reel handle um, something like that to stop it moving because you don't want to lose your rod and reel that's for sure but you don't want to lose a carp because it's got in a, in a snag either so it's not really uh, my bag at all as I said I will do it for days if, if that's where, where they are but I can't even remember the last time I did any serious snag fishing and I certainly wouldn't do it at night after weed as I said um, features in the summer are very very attractive to the fish so features that reach the surface so it could be weed if the weed is thick all over your lake but in one place it's reaching the surface that's the thickest weed that's where they'll tend to be lily pads they reach in the surface now um, and uh, the thicker they get the more attractive they will be to the carp but even early on in the spring you know last month or even now you know they're fairly sparse and i've seen the fish rooting through these today so keep your eyes open for twitching lily pad stems when fish are in lilies they're very very easy to spot so location again you know i could go on about it for the, for the entirety of this video but there is nothing more important and the great thing about summer fishing is that from well before the summer begins as far back as april all the way through to well after the summer in november carp will show on every lake everywhere at some point in the 24 hour period on some lakes they'll show a lot more than that but if you're not seeing carp at all in those height of summer months then they're probably all dead <laughs> they're not in there you should you know stevie wonder could find carp in the summer if you're not finding them then you need to look harder and fish where they are and of course when when it comes to looking for carp there is nothing more important than a pair of polaroids in the summer i've said this before that i would rather go fishing with two rods and my polaroids than three rods and no polaroids um, in fact i'd probably rather go fishing with one rod and polaroids it's that imperative to my angling approach finding the fish and if you can't see them because of the glare on the water then you are behind the eight ball so good quality polaroids i have to wear ones that fit over my glasses um, but you can get them um, online so they're made by a company called cocoons you can search those on the internet i think fortis makes some good overfits as well and if you don't need to fit um, over your glasses because you've got normal eyesight then then jrc makes some really good polaroids as well so get some polaroids if you haven't got them you're seriously at a disadvantage now with location in the summer months there is no more important time to be on the bank than early in the mornings on a day like today when it's cloudy and drizzly and windy then you know on some lakes you could expect to find them throughout the course of the day head and shoulder in or so on depending on the stock level and how hard the lake is but if it's a bright hot sunny day and it's a hard lake that's weedy clear water there are times when the only time you will see them is in that early morning window which is typically from first light up until eight or nine in the morning maybe eight in the morning it depends on how quickly and how bright the sun gets 
So the higher the sun gets and the brighter it gets, the, quick, the, the faster it will nullify that early morning feeding activity. And this is key as well because although we're always looking for carp, finding where they are early in the morning is where they will be feeding. That's where they've been through the night, that's where they're doing their feeding. So sometimes you could turn up at lunchtime in the afternoon and find, find carp maybe basking in weed beds or um, in lily pads or snags, but they aren't necessarily the places where you'll catch them early in the morning. Uh, after you, you know, usually, most sessions, I mean, I'm talking you doing an, an overnight or at least. If you're doing a day session, then you would have got there early in the morning, you're not going to be get there in the afternoon. But if you are fishing in the height of summer, you will definitely find over, if you look back at your diary, or I can tell you from my own experience, that the majority of carp bites that I've had in the summer months are from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. Usually by the time it gets to mid-morning, I've written it off and I'm either going to sit on my hands for the day or I'm going to go and find the fish, depending on whether I think they're still in the area. So when you get to the lake early in the morning and you see fish, that's where they're feeding, that's where they're comfortable, that's where you can expect to get bites from them. Fish showing early in the morning are almost always feeding fish. They will usually come up vertically and slide back down, that classic, as I call a slider. That's that's what you want to be seeing, you know, that's comfortable, happy feeding fish and that really is um, going to earmark your location for you. So if you can, and we all have to do school runs or whatever it is that, that we need to get done, but really if you're serious about your session and you can get to the lake as early in the morning as you can. It's hard work, you know, in, this, in June it's light at 4am so that could mean leaving your house at 3 a.m. But believe me, can make a massive, massive difference. There are some lakes, as I said earlier, that are low stock, weedy, clear lakes that are tough, tough venues. And the only time that you will expect to get a bite is in that early morning window. And it's the only time you can expect to see them. So very often on, on those lakes, I'll be setting out my, my attack where I found them, but I wouldn't be expecting a bite realistically. You can get a bite anytime, obviously, but on a hard lake that's weedy and clear, I'm really planning for dawn the next morning in the same area where I've seen them at dawn the first morning, because carp will very, very often return to where they fed happily and not been disturbed. And that's a real key aspect. So if I find carp early in the morning, I am not going to start getting myself, um, unless I'm doing a day session, even if I was doing a day session, I'd wait till they finish feeding, I think. I know that sounds crazy, but unless I could very discreetly get a couple of singles out there, it would depend on the situation. But generally, what I want to be doing is wait until that activity's died down a bit, then assess the area and put rigs and, and so on into it, fishing for a bite during the night or early the next morning in that same area. Because if I can get everything in place once they've finished feeding, and they've drifted away a bit to do whatever they're going to do in, do in the day. If I then assess the area, I haven't scared them off. Very, very, very often carp will come back to the same area where they were happily feeding. They've moved off of their own accord rather than being pushed off by me. And on hard waters, things like that can make a real difference. So if I was, if I was going to do the night, then that's what I'm doing. I'm planning for a bite at first light the next morning. Although, as I said, you can get a bite any time, but that's the peak time is, is dawn. On any lake, in any country, anywhere in the world that I've fished, it's, it's the same. That's your peak. As I said, the higher the sun gets and the brighter and warmer it gets, the more the fishing activity will dissipate or the fish activity will dissipate. So on days where it's high and bright by eight or nine in the morning, you could see it killed off. The activity they'll stop rolling and everything will go quiet the fizzing will stop on other days you know if you've got wind and drizzle and low pressure and what have you then the potential bite window could last all day it's possible um, so always bear in mind you know what the what the sun is doing and you know if you're generally my cutoff point for winding in and going for a walk and a look or so on is usually about 11 half 10 11 in the morning by then so general rule of thumb that I found on a lot of lakes, but 
I had a bite yesterday on a very tough lake that came just before midday. So, but then again, it's not really summer yet, is it? So anyway, um, on very prolific lakes, certainly like where I am now at Hintlesham, it's, uh, it's possible to get a bite really at any time. But having said that, when you fish a session or two, you will find that there are crescendos of act activity where although you might have been able to get a bite at any time, you might have had three round about dusk or something. And you do find there are certain times where the fish will feed that little bit harder. We're now in the middle of the day, which is quite often a quiet period. Usually going into the afternoons and evenings would be the next sort of good time for a bite. But I'm still confident of a, of a fish. I think mean, I've had six so far and hanging out for a double or something a bit bigger. I had a few small ones, but it's been great fun. So just to cap off location, get to the lake as early in the morning as you can. Make sure you've got Polaroids. Certainly Polaroids early in the morning may not be that um, required to that level because it's early and the fish are on the bottom and you're looking for fizzing, rolling, head and shoulders, sliders, that sort of thing. But during the course of the day when it's bright, for looking under overhangs, watching fish traveling under the surface, anything like that, Polaroids are essential. And even spotting things like areas of what I call nervous water are very valuable indeed. So by that, I mean, today we've got the wind coming over us and, and when, it, when you're on the back of the wind and it's calm, you can quite often get what I call wind devils, which are, uh, you'll get a V go across the surface of the water. It was very much like a fish. When I was younger, I used to think they were fish until I saw one one day in a pub car park. Uh, in a big puddle and um, so watch out for those but slower more um, more what should I say a different kind of V that's a bit slower and more meandering is very often a fish uh, a fish just under the surface and you you know once you've started watching them you'll be able to tell the difference very often the fish in the summer will cruise just under the surface and spotting those tiny little details can help you locate fish later on in the day if you're going to float a fish for them or stalk them, um, anything like that. Quite often um, when fish are on the surface, even though they may not be immediately apparent to, to the casual observer, fish, when they're just under the surface, moving about slowly, will cause these little areas of water displacement as they move. And these are some of the things you should be looking for in the summer months. An absolute classic is the double whirlpool. Two little vortexes. Now uh, that is where a fish has just shifted itself in the current in the current under the surface by wafting its pecs, and that causes the two vortexes. You see a pair of the vortexes a long way apart from each other is a very, very big fish. But um, yeah, two little whirlpools is an absolute sure sign that there's carp under the surface. And again, that I found carp this week just by, by seeing that. Uh, and then I managed to get up a tree with my Polaroids. Sure enough, there were several fish milling about further out. I had to go with a controller, but um, didn't get a bite. But you know, it's a very, very tough lake. But these are the sort of subtle signs that you should be looking for. Floater fishing, of course, is uh, a, a massive subject on its own. And I, I, I wasn't sure whether we should really get in this. I was discussing this with Luke, cameraman earlier. And whilst I've got some floater gear, a, we're not going to be using it or getting it out or anything. We could talk about it, but actually, I think it would be great to do an actual surface fishing video where we just focus on that because it is something that I've dedicated a large part of my life to. And, uh, and I think to, to just mention it during this would be doing it a bit of a disservice. So look out for that in the future. We'll try and get out in the summer months and do some surface fishing. One final element to summer location, which has just come to my mind through the session that I'm doing today and that is that pre-spawning very often you can get the fish split into two different groups. Quite often the bigger, older, fatter females will be away from the younger, energetic, sexed up males and certainly today I mean um, I've had, I think I've had eight today and um, eight or about eight fish, but anyway, it's been a bit of a rush this morning, but they've all been on the small side for, for this lake at Hintlesham Fisheries. You know, there's a lot of incredible double figure and 20 pound scaly fish that are just amazing. And that's what I really, really would like to catch. But um, 
it struck me that um, having had so many very small ones, small little commons, uh, that pre-spawning, probably this is where they're going to come and do it and the males are down here waiting for the females. Quite often you'll find that if there's an area where they're going to get it on, then the males will get there early with their six packs uh, and they'll be smoking in the kitchen waiting for the girls to turn up to the house party. So I suspect that that's in the main part of the lake and um, where, where the girls are at the moment putting their makeup on and, uh, and I'm in the kitchen with all the little boys. So when we finish doing this, um, it's not a fish dependent video, none of these are, they're just about trying to communicate a few uh, tips and uh, bits of guidance to you guys. But um, when we finish that, we're going to wrap up I'm going to move down to the main part of the lake and just fish for a couple of hours, see if I can get a scaly 20. Anyway, that's the plan. So it's just, uh, uh, the reason I mention all that is because it's another thing on location that you, you can bear in mind if you are pre-spawning and you're getting a lot of smaller than average carp. Something I wouldn't have even thought of mentioning until, uh, until right now, it's just occurred to me that that's probably what's happening. So I've got soaking wet and muddy. And uh, I think I've had one, one about mid-double and, uh, and the other's smaller. So anyway, it's been a lot of fun to get some bites because it's been a hard spring. So um, moving on, let's look at bait for the summer. Now, obviously site dependent, you need to bear in mind whether you're fishing busy little, uh, or sort of, I should say well-stocked club and syndicate lakes through to the other end of the spectrum where you could be fishing low stocked hard lakes for big fish. So obviously bait will change hugely according to those. But the one thing that we can be confident of is that out of all the other quadrants of the calendar, this is the quarter where carp will come and eat bait and on occasion lots of it too. The time that I find carp are really up for food is after spawning. So probably by the time you get to see this, oh, actually forget that, they're not going to spawn for a couple of months probably by the way this is looking. Um, but certainly by the time we get the first week of really warm weather on a lot of lakes they're going to be going for it. So once carp have done that, I have found that they are really up for a munch, munch, a big munch. I mean it's the opposite of tench really. Tench, I was just thinking, talking to a couple of guys about it the other day, just before tench spawn, they go ravenous and have a proper feed up. And then after they spawn, you can hardly catch them. Uh, big tench I'm talking about, but uh, carp are the opposite, you know. Big female carp that are holding on to spawn. Very often they just want to get rid of it and you'll catch them fishing small amounts of bait, generally speaking, just fishing for an opportunist bite. And once those big females have shed all that spawn, and they're ready to go, that's the time when you can really ramp it up. So certainly I'd be saying very often from any time after they spawned onwards until the autumn, I like to, on occasion, if it's the right situation, use a lot of bait and you can certainly get away with a lot. Another thing that I would say after spawning is that um, apart from quantity going up, the type of bait also tends to change. And I've found that over a lot of years, once they've spawned, they do, for whatever reason, they really do get turned on by a salty particle type mix. So, chopped tigers, hemp, um, I get a lot of stuff from Cheshire Particle, they do a lot of nice prepared, pre-packed stuff. Um, any kind of particle that, that you can then get in a bucket with some juice, put some salt in, um, I don't add salt to nuts by the way, not to tiger nuts because they will shrivel up and dehydrate but salty hemp and things like that is really really good. I know I'm going to get loads of questions now about salt, how much. Salt is uh, a natural thing even if a lot of people were putting in a lot of salt you couldn't make any negative impact on the, the quality of the water. In fact I know of fisheries out in Oxfordshire that have salt baths for the fish. They'll put them straight into very salty water to clean off parasites. Doesn't do the fish any harm at all. And I remember the late Terry Lampard telling me, and Martin Bowler actually, uh, about the fish that get right down in the estuaries when they're fishing for mullet and so on. They'll see the carp where they've actually sought out salty water. So don't come on saying, oh, salt's bad for carp or anything. They actually love it. And as I said, in angling terms, you couldn't put so much in a lake that you would actually change uh, the pH or the salt levels or anything of it. So 
salt's a natural additive and if you want to put some in it, as a rough guide to a bucket of particle half a kilo or a kilo of salt is fine don't put in cooking salt it's got antioxidants and anti-caking agents and things like that in it himalayan salt something like that that's a pure rock salt or a sea salt uh, are very very good so the particle approach can pay off very very well height of summer single tiger nuts hemp chopped boilies i tend to find that you know when i am using krill which i usually do through the summer months very often i am chopping it up or mushing it up and mixing it in with particle and then maybe fishing a trimmed down krill wafter on one rod and a tiger on the other something like that a really good uh, something we went over at length in the bait chapter that we've done previously but a really great tactic for the height of summer is to get a bucket of lake water and soak your boilies in it uh, I, I tend to do it so i've got maybe a couple of kilos of krill and then enough water to cover them by two or three inches and to that i might add garlic powder again it's something natural you can't overdo it get it from horse feed suppliers i'll add garlic powder and salt and krill liquid to that stir it all up let it soak for a, usually a day and a night full day and a night and at the end of the second day so a good 24 hours minimum the krill should be that soft that you can just smash it in your hands and get your hands into that bucket or use a potato masher if you don't like getting stinky hands and mash all that up and you can create a phenomenal mix which is so high in attraction that's different to anything else that people would be putting in it's boily crumb in effect which is one of the greatest carp fishing weapons ever i've used boily crumb for a long long time now but it's wet mushy boily crumb and if you're looking for something different a real edge you can do it with any type of boily um, then that, that's something certainly to consider mixing in with some particle as well hemp and so on and uh, spawning it out to your spots or spooning it or whatever is your chosen way of introduction i do tend to avoid bright hook baits in the majority of my fishing almost all the time but in the summer i certainly don't want to be on them for two key reasons one by then everyone will have been using them for months since the spring and any fish that are stupid enough to have eaten them will certainly have been caught on them once or twice and will be a bit leery of them but secondly you have got spawned out supercharged fish you know males that are charging around very much sight feeders and if you've got a bright bait there they'll be grabbing it before the more slowly moving meandering females that will be feeding more using their old factory senses um, of sense uh, senses sorry of, of taste and smell rather than sight so i certainly don't want to be on a bright bait and again it's a good bit of advice if you are fishing a lake that's got a lot of small fish in it ditch those straight away and you will find that your stamp of fish will go up it's also worth bearing in mind that if you are fishing a lake that's got a lot of fish in it putting in a mix like i just spoke about is going to attract everything else bream smaller carp and so on so if you are targeting the bigger stamp of fish in your lake then it's also a great time of year just to do some straight boily fishing in small quantities so I'd be looking to use something like a, a 20 mil krill boily bottom bait on the hair and catapulting maybe a dozen around it or putting them in by hand or whatever your chosen preference is. Something really subtle like that can really trip up those bigger fish and although you will get less bites than you will fishing over a spod mix that we just detailed, the average size of fish should go right up. So if you want to break through the doubles and so on and target the bigger fish, that's a great way of doing it. Don't do anything to your hook bait to make it obvious or stand out. One, well actually, if you're leaving it out for any period of time, then I'd use like something like a toughened hook bait, like a krill tough one. But uh, generally just a, a straight krill bottom bait and, and a few freebies around it is a great way to target those bigger fish. Oily pellets, if you, again, if you're fishing a, a lake that is well stocked and you want to get plenty of bites, carp love pellets oily trout pellets and so on are very very effective and um, quite a forgotten method really is scalded trout pellet get your pellets in a bucket pour boiling water over them and you'll be able to make balls of it that can go around your lead or catapult them out oily attraction to the max and it's something again that people don't really use very often you can spawn it out you can put it in by hand hot scalded pellet is absolutely deadly 
So there's a few little bait tips. Um, so whether it's particles, which my choice would be probably chopped nut, tiger and hemp, something like that, through to, I mean, really, it's what you're confident in. My old mate, Chemo, Ian Russell, he swears by uh, red band, pigeon conditioner and stuff like that. And uh, he, he reckons that's one of the best things you can use. So, but the bottom line is, when the weather's hot, very often for getting bites, small hook baits and particle mixes are the way forward. At the other end of the spectrum, if you, if you want to break through big numbers of fish and target less bites but bigger fish than just small quantities of boilies. But the key is fish meal boilies. In the height of the summer, I really strongly believe that there's no better bait for a big, big carp. Um, and actually bear in mind that actually a big carp is relative. So it could be a 22 pound carp in your lake where you've got loads of 10 pounders and 12 pounders. He's the big fish. He will be likely to take a fish meal. And it's the same if you're targeting 30s, 40s or anything like that. When the weather is, is hot, there's very, very little to beat a really high quality fish meal in your bait armory. So I think that just about covers bait, particles, boilies and so on. We've looked at location. And I think next we're going to look at some of the essentials that I take with me to make a summer session not only bearable in terms of uh, dealing with the heat and so on, but profitable in terms of carp returns. So the first of my summer essentials, Polaroid glasses. I mentioned them already, but there is nothing more valuable for finding fish in the summer. They take the glare off the water and if you wear glasses like me, something like these are designed to overfit perfectly. Very, very comfortable. Blot out the light from the side and the top and underneath. So with a peaked cap as well, you get a perfect viewing condition. Um, you can buy these online. Loads of different companies make them. I find that either grey or amber are the best colours. I've got probably six pairs in the van, they're all battered and old, but you know, you can never be without them. I've got a couple in my bag. As I said, they are absolutely a summer angling essential. If you go without them, go at your peril. Ever since I've been fishing, I've been blighted by the blood sucking monsters. Hate them with a passion and they love me like my mate loves cake. So it's a major thing you, you know i've had to deal with it all my life and i know that there's some of you watching this that will be exactly the same it's when, when your biggest passion and hobby is being outdoors by the water you're in a worst possible environment to come in contact with biting insects and they're not always mosquitoes they could be little tiny blandford flies which um i've been bitten a few times by blandford flies google them they're horrendous uh, whatever it is whether it swims crawls, well I say swims, water fleas, horrendous. But used to wade around without any chesties and that, netting fish from my mates or placing a rig and you get bitten by water fleas all over your leg, horrendous, oh man. So whatever it is, if it likes feeding on blood, it'll be, you won't get bit if you're on a lake, if I'm on the lake, because they'll all be on my swim, <laughs> getting me. So protection from that because I swell up and get big lumps has always been a thing so don't like putting all those repellents on me things like uh, anything that contains loads of DEET is really not good for you I mean it melts plastic so I don't really want to be putting that on my skin I've tried a few different things in bad situations but actually I prefer to not put anything on me and get behind a mesh screen which I'll come on to later but last year my ever loving wife who's brilliant, got me a, and my son, they got me a, a Father's Day present. So she had found this on the internet and it was something that I wish I had had when I was younger. It's this bad boy. It's called a Thermocell. Uh, I think the model's called Backpacker, Thermocell Backpacker. Now, what it does, it screws onto a gas canister when you take the plastic plug off, schoolboy error, and it burns at a very, very low controlled heat. I mean, a canister the size of this, you'd probably get two summers out of. I mean, it, it uses hardly any fuel at all. And it burns on a very, very low setting. One of these, which is a blue type wafer. I'm not going to get it out because it's packed in there for a reason. But you take the, the wafer and you slide it underneath the grill 
and then you activate and a tiny flame comes from underneath and unlike things like those mosquito coils which I've used for years you know they do work and sometimes I never would have wanted to be without them but you don't want to be breathing that smoke it's a pesticide you know it's, it's not good and I, I can think of a few occasions where headaches have come on where the wind's been blowing the smoke in the bivvy but um, these don't have any real detectable vapour not by us, certainly by the mozzies though, because when I used it, I was very skeptical, so I thought nothing really works. And I put it on in a mosque, I was fishing in a place which is heaving with them, and it was the first evening I'd been able to sit outside the bivvy on my low chair watching the lake till dusk. It was the first night I'd been able to do it. Every night I've been in by 7 p.m. and you're in behind the screen. So they really, really do work. They're cheap efficient well I don't know if they're cheap to buy it was a present so you'll have to find out for yourselves but um, they're cheap to run very efficient and they really really do help there's a guy who works with me at um, pure fishing on the development side of things and uh, I said oh, I said Nathan I've got a great tip for you you want to get one of these vermicell backpacker things he went oh, I've been using those for 10 years mate I'd never go fishing with outside why doesn't anyone tell me this stuff it's down to my wife to find it on the internet but anyway real life changer, real game changer. It's a summer essential that I will never be going out without again. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I get really hot when I'm in bed. Oh, sounds a bit saucy. Um, on those summer nights when you're out in the bivvy and it's sticky and it's hot, I do not want to be in a sleeping bag. Having said that, you know, even in June, July, you can get those cooler, clear nights where you, where you want something around you to keep you warm. But uh, this is a really good combination. It's the JRC Rover Sleep System and whilst it's got a really, really lightweight sleeping bag system fitted to it, and I've just mentioned why it's fitted to it, I've never used sleep systems in the past because whoever makes them, I've tried a couple, they just seem like being in a straight jacket. They're just so tight across the bed, um, whereas I like to be loose in bed. Um, whereas this, is really generous even if you've got broad shoulders loads and loads of room so lightweight bed chair lightweight sleeping bag but this is this really really cool sleeping bag cover and that's what i just tend to sleep under when it's warm obviously not tonight but um that's it i don't like being in a bag at all this is a really big generous cover and it's actually made for the guys that don't suffer with mosquitoes at all or have got a really good firmer cell to put a bank stick under the top end to keep it open around your head. So if you're doing overnighters or nights under the stars and you're putting your gear under the bed, this bed chair cover is made just to be as a complete cover over for you to do the night under. But a lightweight, beautifully made, high quality sleep system. It's under the Rover label and that's what I'm using this summer. Back when I was a lot younger and uh, a lot more stupid, we just used to tolerate the mosquitoes and on the hottest of stickiest of July nights when they'd be rampant, we'd be under our 50 inch umbrellas and no front or anything and you just used to pull the sleeping bag over your head and you'd hear them buzzing angrily around it all night. You'd never sleep, you'd be sweaty, horrible. Oh, it was hell. They're my worst ever memories of angling. I'll never go through it again. Um, Obviously, having any skin exposed outside the sleeping bag on nights like that, I would have just been obliterated. But these days, it's all about the, the, mesh, the mosquito mesh screens that we get either on brolly systems or bivvies. This is an easy winder, which is um, going to be available later on this year. And um, phenomenal bit of bivvy. I'm not going to talk too much about the bivvy because we'll do that another time. But... I love it because it's light, it goes up and down in an absolute heartbeat using a very clever winding system. But we're here to talk about the mosquito panels. So on the Easy Winder, we've got two big ones at the front. It's a multi-system modular door. You can use one half or the other half or have half of it down. Very, very clever design. But these mosquito panels or anti-mosquito panels, there's four in the front and two in the back, which means I'm gonna get plenty of breeze, air exchange, uh, relief from those stifling hot summer nights and none of those mosquitoes are getting through. One of the key things is it's got a very, very fine mesh and there are a lot of insects around these days, tiny, tiny little black flies that give you a nasty bite and on a lot of the meshes I see on some bivvies, the mesh is that big, they can get straight through it. Uh, nothing is getting through this, it's almost like a tea bag, it's really, really fine. So 
this means I, I can just lay there in my boxes and a t-shirt on those hot, hot nights without worrying that I'm going to get any bad bites or anything like that. It's really, I, I consider it an angling luxury. Never ever would, would I go fishing without a mossy mosquito front on during those summer nights. So that is a summer attention. Okay guys, uh, it's blowing at 55 mile an hour winds today, believe it or not. So absolutely savage weather for May. Good fishing weather though. We've got plenty of bites here. It's been really, really productive this morning. A little bit too productive actually, because we've had work to do. But the general size of fish, as I said, has been below what you'd expect in this lake. So I'm gonna roll the dice, take a gamble, move out of a swim that's doing plenty of bites, which I don't think I've ever done before, unless it was bream. And we're going to go, we've got about three hours, but I'm going to go to the main part of the lake. There's a swim that's sort of caught my eye. I've not seen any fish in it, but I've seen some fizzing. And uh, we're going to get round there, see if we can catch one to show you guys before we go on. So we've moved up to the other end of the lake. Very short window of opportunity to try and get a bite from a better fish. Just got a feeling about this swim, seen some fizz in. There's something drawing me to it. So we're going to try it till we go home in a couple of hours time. Uh, I said I'll show you the easy wind, how quick it goes up. Perfect for these situations. It's very, very stormy. It's going to pour down with rain soon. So I'm going to throw this up as quick as I can. And when people say, that's got to be a wind up, mate. Well, <laughs> this actually is a wind up. There you go. One more turn and we're up. And then all I've got to do is peg it out. I'm sure you'll agree. That's pretty impressive. Well, we moved up to the other end of the lake and didn't pay off with a, a 20 pounder as I'd hoped. Got a couple more fish, but uh, uh, they were for some reason a lot smaller than the average size. But it's been a great day, a dozen or so fish uh, all come into um, light baiting tactics and it's been a lot of fun. And this has been a summer fishing shoot. So if you're watching Greta, put that in your pipe and smoke it and um, we'll see you on a future upcoming one if you uh, like the film then please tell your mates thanks for following and for your support and we'll see you again soon <laughs> <laughs>